Okay. Um, hello, welcome everybody to um, a webinar hosted by the Desert LTC. I'm Genevieve Johnson. I'm the coordinator for the Desert LTC, and today we are very pleased to have several people on the phone who will be introducing the um, Eastern Mojave Conservation Cooperative. It's an effort to look at landscape conservation design um, in a particular geography of the LTC, and um, I'm going to ask the presenters to introduce themselves briefly. Um, Colleen, we'll go ahead and start with you. Hi, uh, my name is Colleen Whitaker. I'm a facilitator with a small group based in Tucson called Southwest Decision Resources. Uh, we work on natural resource management collaborations with a variety of partners in Arizona and the Southwest. And we've been working with the Desert LCC on this landscape conservation design process. Thank you. Great, Brian? If we can hear you. All right, we'll introduce Brian next. Um, Roy, actually, maybe you can give a brief introduction to yourself and Brian while we get him back on the phone. Sure, this is Roy Averill Murray. I'm the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services uh, Desert Tortoise Recovery Coordinator. And Brian Croft, if he is not online yet. Uh, I see he's back on Adobe Connect, but um, he'll be hopefully joining us audibly um, here soon. He is, uh, is with the uh, services uh, Palm Springs uh, field office as a uh, one of the regional supervisors uh, in Southern California. Great, thank you so much. Um, so thanks again to, for joining us today. Um, and I want to let everybody know that we are going to be recording this webinar. And we, we will make the webinar available on our YouTube channel in, um, in about a week after we get it processed. If you have any questions during the presentation, please uh, feel free to put them into the chat box um, along the way. We'll try to see if there's uh, questions that are particularly relevant to uh, uh, the topic that we're discussing. We'll try to get it answered, or we will hold them all to the end. Um, everybody on the phone is muted, and so um, at the end, I'll call for unmuting our phones, um, and we'll try to also ask for questions then. Um, and with that, we will go ahead and get started. Um, Colleen, can you advance? Thank you. Um, so today we are going to just go through a very brief introduction to the Desert LCC. I hope at this point um, most folks are familiar with not only ourselves, but the Landscape Conservation Cooperative in general, and a brief introduction to landscape conservation design. What we really want to focus on, however, during this webinar is the Eastern Mojave Conservation Collaborative and talking about how we got that formed and where we are to date, as well as anticipated outcomes and benefits from the process itself and then, of course, next steps and how to get involved. Next. This is just a brief map of um, the LCC network as a whole. Um, there are 22 LCCs across North America. Um, they were basically formed on um, across different jurisdictions, um, looking at ecosystem boundaries, uh, specifically also looking at partnerships related to the joint ventures. And we were really formed to help facilitate conversations uh, about large landscape conservation regarding uh, problems that individual agencies or organizations couldn't solve by themselves. Can you hit next? The Desert LCC is that little orange blob down there towards the bottom. You'll notice that we have the majority of our geography actually in Mexico. Um, we are formed from the Mojave, Sonoran, and Chihuahuan desert regions, um, but it does include all of the ecosystems within that large geography beyond just the desert. Next. The Desert LCC, um, along with all of the LCCs, are non-regulatory, so there's nothing that we can do that makes people um, have to implement anything, um, and nothing that the partnerships can do that um, require any of our partners to, to do a particular action. We are self-directed, which means basically um, we have a steering committee and our partners who prioritize our work and tell us what we should be working on and how we should move forward. 
We are working to support, facilitate, and promote landscape scale conservation. So a lot of that has to do with building on existing partnerships and adding value where we can, crossing those jurisdictional political management boundaries. Um, so a lot of that, of course, not only involves coordination, but continuous communication and data sharing. And then again, as a partnership, we are collectively identifying our priorities um, not just for resource management, but also for science, uh, how we're funding science, how we're collaborating, how we're using data, and how we're integrating it. Next. One of the major things that um, our steering committee has worked on is to develop a common vision. You'll see this language, of course, quite often um, across multiple conservation partnerships, really focusing on resilient landscapes that are capable of responding to environmental challenges, and that we are supporting natural and cultural values for current and future generations. Um, we are, with our partners, developing priority resources with goals, priority science needs, and priority activities. The point of this is that really it's a way for us to focus our work. It's not that everything across um, the landscape or that everything that people are working on isn't important. It's just we're trying to find the common values that these large landscapes hold for our partners and focus on those as we move forward. Next. So we're going to move into the brief introduction of landscape conservation design. LCCs across the network are moving in this direction. This uh, photo that you see before you is an example from the South Atlantic LCC. Um, they've created what they call um, the South Atlantic Blueprint, where they have looked at values um, of their partners hold in common and identified areas of highest conservation value or priority of, of where people should um, look at concentrating their resources based on those values. And you can see that the areas in this map of darkest purple um, are the highest priority areas in gray or where they've identified corridors for connectivity, that sort of thing. Um, and this is just an example of a product that we would be moving towards in the desert LCC as well. Next. So again, landscape conservation design is really a process to identify, develop, and strengthen collaborative relationships. Um, so we were working really hard to convene partners across these large uh, geographies to determine priorities. Next. And from there, we're identifying common resource and social values. Um, so uh, specifically in the desert LCC, across all of our landscape conservation design areas, people have identified um, grasslands, springs, streams, and the associated riparian areas as high priority. Um, and then looking at what those threats are to those systems, um, you know, whether it's invasive species, um, drought, for instance. And next. And then how we can really develop specific goals that everybody feels um, uh, represents their work and their values and measurable objectives from there. Next. We're also looking to produce information and tools that are needed by our partners to meet those common goals. So we want to build on existing work, um, like the Cal California's Wildlife Action Plan, all the other state wildlife action plans, which have already identified a lot of uh, specific species and goals. Um, BLM's Rapid Eco Regional Assistance are another example of that. Um, we want to put all of that information together, look at assessing the current conditions. Next. And then um, we'll also be developing future scenarios. So with those partnerships, um, with all those partners across those geographies, really being able to kind of agree on what our mutual futures might look like to help guide our decision making. Next. And importantly, um, landscape conservation designs really rely on our partners to implement actions. So again, the LCC itself can't really implement anything. And because we're not regulatory, of course, we can't force anybody to implement anything. The idea, though, is that all of our partners come together because we realize we have these common issues. And within their own authorities, they can collectively contribute to conservation goals, which include um, identifying adaptation strategies, um, a suite of adaptation strategies that individual partners can implement some of. Next. Um, and then designing on the ground um, where actions best meet those goals. So an example of that, for instance, um, like I mentioned before in the South Atlantic blueprint is the idea that where there are areas of highest conservation priority, partners can concentrate resources in, that er in those areas to achieve those goals. 
next. And then going through a learning process to monitor our outcomes and then revise as needed. Um, because the LCC is non-regulatory, we can be a little bit more flexible in having those discussions and learning from um, our techniques, learning from data coming in, learning from um, what partners are actually doing on the ground and help distribute that information more broadly. Next. So um, one thing that's important um, about landscape conservation design is just to talk a little bit about how it's different from traditional planning. Um, usually in traditional land use planning, there's an uh, agent represents single institutions. So you know one individual agency is going out with a plan that they are going to implement. Um, it has a lot of internal coordination. It's really meant to achieve that specific um, organization's missions, mandates, or goals. Um, and there's a lot of the learning and decision making is, very internal within their own institutional boundaries. Of course, they're also regulatory, which gives them um, the authority to implement. Um, and um, they are looking at developing products that meet those specific needs um, of their land use planning effort. And landscape conservation design is a little bit different. Um, we have uh, cross-jurisdictional multi-sector representation um, and a bridging entity. So the Desert LCC is kind of trying to act as that bridging entity. And we're trying to meet multiple partner mission mandates and goals. Um, and so we're trying to learn from each other, trying to make decisions as a collective group. Um, and we'll look beyond um, institutional boundaries. It's meant to be um, not only collaborative, but really driven by our partners. So our partners are directing our process. They're directing kind of what our products are, what needs to come out of it, and how those things can be implemented by them and best used. Next. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Colleen. And she's going to talk more specifically about the landscape conservation design process within the Desert LCC today. OK, thank you, Genevieve. Um, so uh, the landscape conservation design process uh, kicked off with two introductory workshops in late 2015 in both Tucson, Arizona, and uh, Aguas Calientes, Mexico. So these workshops um, helped to inform the pilot area nomination process, as well as begin to, sh to identify shared goals and resource issues and uh, opportunities for collaboration. So we did have a small contingent of Eastern Mojave folks join the Tucson workshop, actually, and had some good initial discussion about priorities in the area and work that is currently going on. Um, Roy was amongst those. Uh, next, we initiated the Desert LCC's partner assessment. And that's a process that's working to support partner identification and engagement in the landscape conservation design process, as well as the broader LCC network. So the assessment. Uh, will help to identify opportunities for collaboration and help partners find out more about what their peers are doing in the area. So uh, here you see a small screenshot of some of the mapping work that was done by participants in the Aguas Calientes workshop as part of that assessment. So the Desert LCC did receive 12 pilot area nominations. Um, and again, the purpose of the pilot areas is to kind of help break down the very large Desert LCC landscape into pieces that are more reasonable to deal with and, and in ways that allow us to connect to partners at the appropriate scale. So these are pilot areas, emphasis on pilot, because they're intended to sort of inform the landscape conservation design approach moving forward. Of those 12 nominations received, three pilot areas were selected to move forward, the Madrean watersheds, Dos Rios, and the Eastern Mojave. So you can see those here. In dark gray, you see the desert LTC boundary. The Dos Rios area was actually a combination of two nominations, the Big Bend and Upper Rio Bravo area and the Lower Rio Conchos. And the Madrean watersheds was also a combination of nominations from the San Pedro watershed within the larger transboundary Madrean watershed nomination. So you see that just the approximate geographies here. And you'll notice, um, obviously, the Madrean and Dos Rios areas cover uh, portions of the US and Mexico. Um, Clearly, the Eastern Mojave does not. Uh, these two were initiated a little before the Eastern Mojave process. And in fact, the Madrean watershed held their first big partner convening in Tucson last September. So now I'd actually like to turn you over to Brian uh, Croft to talk a little bit more specifically about this Eastern Mojave process. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Croft. I'm a division chief uh, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Palm Springs, California. I've been working in uh, collaborative partnerships in the Amargosa since around 2003 uh, at the project level, implementing a variety of different restoration and research projects, mostly in the Shoshone, Shoshone and Tacopa areas of California. And I'm going to provide just a, a, a background on the focal area uh, that this effort is currently targeting, uh, some of the key resources that make it unique, and the current goals and focus of the effort. Uh, based on some of the outreach that we've done prior to this webinar. Uh, next. Our current focal area encompasses uh, the Eastern Mojave Recovery Unit for the Desert Tortoise, uh, the watershed for the Amargosa River, and the general boundaries of the groundwater flow system that supports uh, important spring systems within the region. Uh, at this point, we believe that this uh, geogra geography accomplishes a few different things. Uh, it's, it's large enough to allow, um, allow the effort to consider the conservation needs of species and resources that require large areas or conservation of habitat linkages. It's also large enough to allow for modeling and consideration of management needs under potentially changing environmental conditions. Uh, it en encompasses the groundwater flow system uh, that supports many of the region's sensitive resources. Uh, it's it's um, constrained enough to allow for effective collaboration across jurisdictions. And it's small enough to also allow us to retain uh, resolution in terms of developing management tools and models to support adaptive management. Uh, next. So one of our goals uh, in this effort uh, will be to work with partners in this region to foster management of focal resources across existing jurisdictional and planning boundaries. Uh, the first step in this process uh, is to identify interested partners, uh, the focal resources for the collaboration to center around, and shared management objectives. And in setting the stage for that discussion, it's important to think about uh, some of the unique characteristics of the region. Uh, the current focus area encompasses the Eastern Mojave Recovery Unit for the de Desert Tortoise, uh, which, which contains both important core populations for the species and linkage areas for the species. Uh, these important areas cross uh, multiple jurisdictions and require effective uh, collaboration to, to have um, efficient management for conservation. In addition, the focus area is characterized by many uh, locations with springs, seeps, and streams that are supported by local and regional groundwater resources. These resources support a, a large number of endemic species that are only found within the focus area boundaries. Uh, next. So the, one of the purposes of the kickoff webinar is really to reach out to interested partners and stakeholders to try and get input that will allow us to shape the, the scope, the focus, and the direction of this collaborative effort. Uh, however, our, our coordination team is operating under some general goals and principles to help guide the process. Our, our overarching goal is to promote effective collaboration by leveraging resources to achieve lasting conservation outcomes in the eastern Mojave Desert. And in order to, to do this, we aim to next. We aim to implement, uh, to follow various guiding principles uh, in working towards that goal. Uh, one is that we recognize that we need to work together to develop critical information and tools to support management actions. Uh, we also believe that the collaborative effort needs to be action-oriented and not get bogged down in, in a planning process. Uh, we also feel that there's a need that the collaboration needs to be an ongoing forum for partnership and coordination, and we need to have shared leadership and the development of shared funding. Next. In terms of timeline, uh, we are currently focused on conducting outreach and gathering existing information. You can go ahead and click through, uh, through these. Uh, once we have critical mass in terms of partners interested in participation, uh, we will begin working on identifying the shared goals and objectives that lend themselves to this sort of collaborative process. Next. 
Uh, so currently our, our uh, Eastern Mojave coordination team is comprised of land management and wildlife agency representatives from California and Nevada. Uh, this team will help in guiding the collaborative process with help from the Desert LCC and Southwest Climate Science Center. Uh, this team is also connected to the coordinating teams from the other LCD pilot areas uh, within the Desert LCC to allow for incorporation of ideas from other similar efforts. Next. So from the beginning, uh, the, the coordinating team has emphasized uh, outreach and collaboration and, and plotting the direction for this process. We, we want to steer the process towards a useful and successful outcome. So we have spent quite a bit of time on phone calls with, with some of you to try to get open-ended input on what is important to you in the area, uh, what are some of the constraints and hurdles to successful collaboration on some of the key resource issues, and how would a successful collaborative effort be, collaborative effort be structured. Uh, we've tried to summarize at a very high level some of the key themes that we have gleaned so far. First, conservation of wildlife linkages, management of groundwater, and control of invasive species are near the top of most people's lists when it, come to the, when it comes to the primary conservation challenges in the focus area. Second, a collaborative process could be very useful in integrating land use plan implementation across the California and Nevada state line. And it can help in linking up priorities and shared objectives between different land use plans to help find areas of consistency and synergy. A collaborative process should also be a useful way to step down large regional scale land use plan, plan objectives to more local level management implementation. And as always, the primary hurdle to getting anything done is limited funding. In terms of collaboration, we got the message uh, that planning alone was not a desirable outcome of this effort and that we needed to focus on processes and tools that would help support management implementation. Uh, there was support for the use of a standing collaborative body uh, to help integrate management implementation under a shared set of priorities. Uh, but we got mixed responses on how exactly to proceed with helping to foster that, that collaboration. Um, there are existing collaborative bodies, uh, such as the Desert Managers Group, the Desert Tortoise Management Oversight Group, uh, and the Southern Nevada Area Partnership uh, that, that are already currently in place. Uh, some input that we received pointed towards the integration of our efforts into one of these existing groups. Uh, other input, input pointed to a, a misalignment of the geographic scope and management focus and makeup of these groups and trying to address the needs of the Eastern Mojave focus area. So this is an area that will require more input through this process to resolve. Finally, we got quite a bit of agreement from, both, from people we talked to on the need for leadership, broad participation and buy-in and engagement of participants in the collaboration that, that do on the ground implementation of management actions. Next. So I'm going to hand the presentation over to Roy Abram Murray from the Desert Tortoise Recovery Office, who will talk about the Desert Tortoise Management Oversight Group, uh, which is a collaborative management process focused on desert tortoise recovery. Uh, he's going to present information on geospatial decision support tools that this group uses to, to help set management implementation priorities. Thanks, Brian. So yeah, this is kind of an example of um, a single species of example relevant to this area that we're hoping that will be useful in expanding um, uh, to either other focal resources or modifying and, and um, uh, adapting and customizing even uh, more finely for the Eastern Mojave. Uh, recovery unit, but it's uh, but it, it as it stands now, it provides an example of of a lot of the uh, goals and objectives of the uh, overall landscape conservation design process. And so um, the 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 desert tourist spatial decision support system um, is an example where we took. Uh, we developed a conceptual model of how uh, numerous threats affect desert tortoises, and that's the little flowchart-looking diagram on the on the left, and how how all of these things conceptually affect tortoise populations, 
and also how different conservation actions or recovery actions uh, can be implemented to break these threat linkages. So it gives us a, a starting model um, to connect to geospatial information represented by the, the uh, maps in the middle of the slide uh, for all of that, re that um, summarize where each of the various threats occur um, across the landscape and, and, and where these impacts to desert tortoises are occurring. Then we can link those two things with where we actually expect tortoises to, uh, to be in this over um, overarching landscape uh, with a, a habitat model, habitat potential model, whatever. And, and so we have the, the conceptual model of how threats work, uh, affect tortoises, where those threats are in the landscape uh, relative to where tortoises are uh, or should be on the landscape. And that leads to the next slide, which shows the uh, ultimate uh, risk or modeled risk to desert tortoises across the landscape where um, the red colors are higher degrees of uh, risk and risk and the cooler colors are uh, lower degrees of risk and and so by looking by collapsing that entire big messy conceptual model into uh, more specific information on where threats and tortoises occur in the landscape, we can get a sense of uh, relative risk and drill down further and look at specific areas on the next slide that uh, allow us to see on the next slide the um, the rankings of threats in a, a, a given area, for example, a, a critical habitat unit for the for the desert tortoise, and see what uh, the contribution is directly in blue or indirectly uh, uh, in brown. Um, you know the the level of risk added to tortoise populations, and then. Uh, we can look at the flip side, you know, our set of conservation or recovery actions. Nope, oh, still previous slide. And look at the the uh, the, the relative effectiveness of different um, recovery actions on uh, mitigating those risks or eliminating the uh, the risk to tortoises, and see for a specific area what. Uh, conservation or recovery actions, we expect to uh, give us the greatest risk uh, or reduction in risk for tortoise populations. And obviously, this is going to vary from uh, uh, location to location based on uh, what's actually going on or what the, the underlying threats are in that area. Now, the, the next slide uh, shows how the Desert Tortoise Management Oversight Group used this information and, and trying to prioritize how the agencies working, you know, responsible for desert tortoise management or habitat management across the range were going to uh, use this information uh, to prioritize how they were going to spend money on tortoise uh, recovery. So um, what they did is uh, lo looked at what the um, rankings were across 28 different conservation areas across the tortoises range, and and uh, asked you know how did how often did different recovery actions fall out in the top five for that for a particular area, and that and this bar chart shows you know for example that. Uh, habitat restoration was in the top five in every single conservation area, and so it became the top uh, priority. And and everything else is ranked, uh, uh, you know, falls out accordingly uh, below that. So th this is this established the management oversight group's top five priorities that they have uh, recently committed to um, uh, focusing attention on recovery implementation. And for example, last, just last year, about roughly five and a half million dollars were uh, allocated to uh, mostly to projects in this in these top five categories. So it's a, an example of how uh, use, you know using this um, these tools to uh, 
uh, identify shared uh, priorities and and then leverage funding or uh, identify and, and target funding on uh, priorities that were agreed upon by uh, the, the group of people. And you can imagine that um, in, within the Eastern Mojave uh, focal area that similar things could be done with um, by by looking at how different conservation actions of rank out for different uh, different re resources, whether terrestrial or aquatic, or other other ways of of uh, combining this kind of information to identify priorities for implementation. And next, we uh, so so looking you know kind of uh, beyond and, and into a little bit more specifics on some of the stuff that that the previous uh, speakers have talked about within the eastern uh, Mojave focal area. Uh, we are, you know, kind of working towards these overarching um, goals of uh, uh, conservation of biodiversity, connectivity, and socio-ecological services. But within those goals, we're, we want to tailor the priorities to uh, fit the needs of the partners and, and drill down into more specific objectives that the next slide kind of uh, outlines and um, as a straw dog that the coordinating team kind of uh, put together based um, uh, uh, largely on the input we received in the initial outreach that Brian mentioned, but um, also some just some internal um, uh, uh, discussion and just to, to get something kind of on the on the table as a initial straw dog of of what kinds of things we want to to model, of you know, focus, you know, identify as focal resources that uh, we should uh, be uh, working together to measure and, and manage to meet those overarching goals. And so we have these things that, um, uh, as Brian mentioned uh, previously, at large area uh, habitat uh, connectivity uh, related resources, um, uh, dune systems. Um, and and then in uh, various uh, wetland or, or aquatic riparian uh, related uh, resources which have you know, associated focal uh, species uh, within them. Then uh, so the the next step in this uh, overall process or, or you know for this webinar at least is, is to share what we perceive, at least, as the uh, anticipated benefits and outcomes of the the process. And so, uh, the next slide kind of describes uh, the first kind of set of of, of benefits, the high level benefits. That um, to just reiterating some of the stuff from before is so that a, a coordinated landscape conservation effort within this increasingly variable environment. Uh, this this coordination will um, uh, naturally lead to improved interagency and public private cooperation, and. Uh, hopefully, as uh, I described with the Desert Tortoise example, will lead to some increased funding leverage or, or funding focuses on these um, shared resource priorities. Some of the tools that will be beneficial are, uh, include shared databases uh, that will help make data and information more accessible to both the managers and the public. Um, uh, what I think is a, a really uh, exciting um, uh, tool or, or benefit is the is this second one on, on integrating scenario planning into the process, not just looking at uh, static, or, you know, what how the landscape looks today, uh, but incorporating scenarios of of of. Um, human-related change, growth and development, as well as climate uh, changes or or other uh, biological changes, and 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 having it be a forward-looking uh, tool and um, planning process, and which um, would 
bring along geospatial decision support tools to inform management decisions and, and prioritize implementation based on these different scenarios and, and, uh, and information. So already the, the Desert LCC has a number of mapping resources that the uh, Eastern Mojave pilot area can uh, take advantage of. Uh, already existing data assessments are being added to USGS's science base, and a conservation planning atlas has been built in uh, databasin. Uh, you see the web address uh, on the uh, in the middle of the slide there, um, which it draws it, it draws the data out of um, science space to uh, uh, allow for users to see different combinations of of what's happening on the ground where and and so on. Next, the, the, our first order of business is to continue mapping the baseline conditions and assessments and inventories. Uh, what's going on? Where? What's what kind? What conservation uh, conservation actions have already been implemented? Who's doing what? Where? Basically, all of this is to uh, help us understand. You know what gaps remain? What conservation actions are most needed? How does this tie into uh, our, the, those focal resource uh, priorities that uh, will be identified? And and uh, and. and then from there understand where the greatest opportunities are for uh, collaboration. The, um, as I mentioned before, the scenario planning is one of the, I, I think, the really huge benefits of uh, this process. And the Desert LCC is uh, working with the Southwest Climate Science Center to integrate the scenario planning um, a capability into the landscape conservation design process. And so uh, with this, we'll have um, uh, access, we'll be able to help identify long-term strategies uh, for, for uh, conservation actions um, and, and uh, inform decision-making related to those. We'll be able to think more systematically about many of the you know, critical uncertainties r related to uh, the future status of, of our uh, focal uh, resources and, and overarching goals. And it'll help us enhance opportunities for innovation and, uh, and to promote collaboration and critical relationships among sci and between uh, scientists and the stakeholders in the region. And I think with that, Colleen is going to uh, close out with what's next. Thank you, Roy. Yeah, so to close this out, uh, I just want to give you a little information about what's coming up next more immediately and a little bit further out, and then um, some ways that you can get involved. So what's ahead in 2017? Um, we'll be conducting more, research, more outreach to partner groups for input on ecosystems and resource priorities, key social and community values, and on potential indicators. We'll build on the existing tools and plans in the area. And again, that's something that uh, the message has come through loud and clear. It's really important to build on what is already there, and we will. Uh, we'll identify indicators that are appropriate for modeling the priorities identified through the process. And we'll work to synthesize existing information map baseline conditions and geographic extents, as Roy was mentioning. And yes, the scenario planning, I agree, is a, a really exciting component of this process. So we will work with the Southwest Climate Science Center to incorporate scenarios into this as we move forward. Uh, and finally, we're currently anticipating convening key partners in the late fall or winter of 2017. Uh, looking out a little further, in 2018, we anticipate working to identify management strategies that partners can implement uh, either together or individually for maximum collective impact. So these will be focused on meeting the objectives identified by the partners and stakeholders through the process, and uh, they'll be targeted to address the key stressors or vulnerabilities. We'll also continue to share the lessons learned from this pilot area with others in the desert LCC and uh, other LCCs beyond, and also uh, continue learning from what others are doing 
so that we're, we're iteratively learning and sharing as we go. Um, there are a couple ways for you to get, get involved right now. So the link at the top of the slide uh, will take you to a page where you can sign up for these things. Um, if you'd like to receive periodic update emails, and that would include invitations to uh, workshops, you can join the mailing list. And we invite you all to please do that. Um, secondly, a stakeholder forum is currently being formed to help represent the many diverse stakeholders and interests in the area. So forum members um, will receive periodic briefings on the progress and also help to provide targeted feedback and input to the process as relevant. These folks will also help link to their own networks and ensure that the process is really inclusive and balanced and considers um, all the perspectives and expertise necessary. So um, again, there are link, there's the link to join those. And I believe we're going to have that link on the last page as well. So you don't have to worry if you didn't write it down. Finally, I just wanted to introduce you briefly to the members of the Landscape Conservation Design Core Team. So you can put some faces to names. Genevieve Johnson, um, who is presenting today, is the coordinator of the Desert LCC. Matt Graybow is the science coordinator for the Desert LCC. Louise Mistal is project lead, and she's with the Sky Island Alliance based in Tucson. Mo Carell is the landscape ecologist with the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Tony, Tony, Tony Robertson is a facilitator. Uh, and uh, there I am, Colleen. We are both with Southwest Decision Resources. So that's our core team. And we um, support all three of the pilot area processes so that we're, we're making sure the process is learning from each other and we're all staying coordinated. So um, with that, again, there are those links for staying informed and follow on questions or comments. Welcome to myself and Genevieve and Matt. Thank you. Great. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, of course, we do have, so far, we have one comment in the chat box. Um, I will turn that over to um, the folks on the phone. Um, if you have other questions, please go ahead and enter them in the chat box now. And um, Ashwin, if you could work on um, unmuting folks for those people who aren't online. Um, the first question that we had um, was, what about risks from solar or wind development? And um, I don't know if Roy or Brian, if you want to just take a stab at answering that one. Well, as far, this is Roy, as far as the uh, desert tortoise uh, um, decision support system, solar you know, uh, development habitat loss was in, incorporated at least at a, at a basic level in, in that system and is, is accounted for. There are some uh, design, some model improvements and things that we're um, working on hoping to get online to, to uh, extend that or, or improve it. Uh, but as, as Genevieve uh, replied more generally and relative to the landscape conservation design process, that's definitely, you know, it's, you can't ignore it. Um, you can't help but uh, be uh, aware of it and everything. And, and so um, those, the, uh, you know, I think models of, uh, of effects of existing developments or potential effects of, of proposed developments are, are certainly, uh, it, it's hard to imagine not incorporating those along the way. Colleen, can you flip back to the core team, comp co the core team composition? Um, and so, Jerry, um, the core team is uh, just that group of people, uh, us mostly, <laughs> who are doing this basically every day. <laughs> um, the coordinating teams are the individuals within each in, um, landscape conservation design pilot area who are working um, hand in hand with us to adapt the process and products specifically for those geographic areas. And Jerry probably can't hear me answer that, so I apologize. We have a few um, other questions being typed in.
Who's going to hit enter first? Um, Ashwin, can you go ahead and unmute everyone? Everyone has been unmuted. Great. So if you... If you have um, a question that you just want to ask on the phone, um, you might have to unmute your individual phone um, line, but you can go ahead and ask it that way as well. Um, there's a comment from Chris Tomlinson, um, identifying connectivity, species diversity areas, core conservation areas may help us plan for avoidance areas for future renewable energy, uh, and this process will help with long-term planning. Um, and I think that's a, that's a key point, um, Chris, is that as we move forward in the landscape conservation design, um, in, in some of the other LCCs, not only are they identifying areas of conservation priority, but they are actually identifying um, areas where development or transportation routes um, should go to avoid those key areas as well. Uh, an example is up in the Arctic LCC, where they've actually designed um, where shipping routes um, should go to help avoid key habitat uh, and, and birthing areas for marine mammals. And um, Junko Hoshi notes that a lot's already been done under the um, Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan um, for the analysis. Um, and absolutely, that's one of our, our key documents that we'll be looking at the pool information in um, and discuss um, with the, the whole team um, as we move forward as well. We also have a note from Eileen Anderson. Um, Bob tortoise is a great umbrella species for landscape planning. Um, how do other species, habitats, unique aspects, including cultural, get incorporated into this process? Does anybody else want to answer that? I think really the first step is, is identifying what our shared objectives are going to be for whatever focal resources we identify. And I think that's where um, that's really going to drive what we work on and, and how things get incorporated into the process. Yeah. The, the tortoise is an obvious uh, terrestrial resource, uh, because, A, because there's a, a lot of collaboration already happening. It's a listed species, so it's attracting a lot of uh, that attention. But it, even it, it doesn't cover all of the terrestrial bases. And then, you know, one of the uh, key uh, features of the area that, that Brian pointed out is all the um, uh, wetland and riparian uh, resources and endemic species associated with those. Um, so th that is all those resources and drilling down and figuring out what to, to focus on is you know a key part of the process. Okay, um, and as a follow-up, who decides um, what those other focal areas are? And I guess I can answer that. <laughs> um, it's, it's actually the team itself. So it'll be the coordinating team um, who helps do a lot of that work. We have um, a lot of discussion going on right now with the coordinating team to do that additional outreach with partners who um, can provide some um, important input um, into these kind of questions, but maybe don't want to be involved on a you know, biweekly or monthly basis. Um, so we're trying to get a lot of the information collated, um, synthesized, and then make sure that we're reaching out to everybody to get input on that. But ultimately, it's the coordinating team who will make those final decisions. I think this is where, though, that also the stakeholder forum is a place for yes. people to provide input into that so that we're not, the coordinating team isn't overlooking uh, something obvious or or something that's really important that uh, someone else outside of this uh, group um, uh, comes up with on on their own. 
Yeah, that's a great point, Roy, um, and especially important for folks who, um, you know, might want to stay engaged um, with this process outside of just, you know, being invited to workshops or newsletters. That stakeholder forum, um, we're currently working on some methods to um, get input um, from that broader group of, of stakeholders um, in different ways. Uh, so we might do it uh, on an online forum, for instance, certainly during workshops, maybe even some um, conference calls, that sort of thing. And we want to make sure that we want that we go out um, to that group of folks with um, some specific questions and um, draft documents, that sort of thing, so that folks can uh, participate and provide input along the way. Um, we have a note from Junko um, that, oh, sorry, I just have to scroll down. Everybody's typing too fast. <laughs> um, that species habitat relationships have been considered under the Desert Renewable Energy um, Plan, California SWAPs, the State Wild Wildlife Action Plans. Um, I'm sure it's been considered on the Nevada side as well as the California side. Um, and many of those have um, ecosystem conservation strategies um, as well as the Nature Conservancy, BLM, local um, conservancy place-based um, partnerships as well, have great plans and data. Um, and so we will, um, what we're doing now is kind of collating the stuff that we do know. We're going to go back out again, um, probably in a, a method like this, to a group like this, and ask if we're missing anything. If you have um, documents or data that you feel are really important, um, please feel free to share them with us so we can make sure that we have them in our list. Um, and then Junko is actually bringing up a, sort of a next step um, a little bit later, is when we develop these collaborative um, strategies for conserving these resources, again, we're not trying to come, you know, reinvent the wheel. We're really trying to build on things that people are already doing. Um, build on lessons learned so that partners can implement things um, in ways that um, are more efficient, meaning that if somebody's done something in one geography and they've learned what works and what doesn't, they can share that so that hopefully if somebody in a different geography can implement it, they can speed that learning process up a little bit. And being able to do that collectively um, means that we need to pull those kind of existing strategies from documents um, and, and efforts that currently exist. We also have um, a note from Chris about Department of Energy and Department of Defense, um, if they're participating in this collaborative process. And, and Junko also notes that some DOD staff would be excited to hear more about this. Um, I'm going to actually turn that over to, to Roy and Brian to answer. Uh, well, in the, on the California side of the border, uh, we don't, well, the, the north eastern corner of Fort Irwin, I believe, comes into the plan area. Um, we haven't reached out to them yet, uh, but that's something we'll, we'll certainly do. Uh, relative to DOD, DOE, and uh, uh, Nevada, um, they have been uh, looped in or uh, outreach has been done primarily via the Desert Tourist Management Oversight Group uh, and, and uh, kind of background presentation so far. Uh, uh, on the project uh, to to that group um, since they're um, involved with um, uh, tortoises already uh, we've been able to loop them in at, at that level and so they'll be uh, it'll continue to be um, uh, in the uh, distribution list or, or whatever other uh, more engaged role they um, uh, choose to uh, participate in. Um, and I would note that if there's anybody in particular that um, you would like us to reach out with or have a conversation with, please just let us know. Any other um, questions um, or comments? Hi, Genevieve. This, this is Junko. Um, I just want to add it up with a question about DOE, but uh, not only the agency, but um, there are a lot of private sectors who are interested in, especially for mitigating, you know, um, tortoise species. Um, so, uh, for example, PGME, um, Edison, and so on, um, are probably very, very interested in this effort too. 
And um, along with that, um, under SWAP, we created the companion plan for energy sector. So um, I don't know when the right timing because it's easy to quickly expand the you know, partnership and it could be overwhelming, but when you are ready, uh, we can provide all those um, uh, contact so um, you can engage them too for this process. Okay, thanks, Junko. Um, I think that, if, especially if you know of one, uh, a couple of individuals that um, you think are key, um, you can send them to me and I'll forward them to the group. Okay, then I'll do it right after this. Thank you. Excellent. Any last questions or comments? All right. Well, um, if you if you think of anything um, after the end of our webinar, um, please feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, not only uh, uh, the coordinating. Uh, team's information online, um, but of course so is um, the Desert LCC staff. And uh, if you know anybody personally, please feel free to, to just give them a call, let them know what you think. Um, this is a collaborative process and we want to make sure that what we're doing helps meet the needs of our partners. Um, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, thank you to everybody for presenting today. Thank you to all of you for, for being on today. This is one of our, our first efforts in making sure that we're communicating to a larger audience. We'll continue to do that, hopefully more regularly um, in the next year. And so again, if you're interested in, in staying engaged, either through things like this webinar um, or newsletters or workshops, um, please feel free to add your name to the Stay Informed list. Um, if you'd like to be a little bit more engaged, spend a little bit more time with us, um, please join the Stakeholder Forum. Um, again, thank you to everybody for participating and, and taking the time to be with us today. As a reminder, we have recorded this webinar. It will be made available on our YouTube channel, um, which you can uh, access either through our website or just search um, YouTube for Desert LCC and it will pop up. That should be up on um, YouTube in about a week. If you need the presentation um, directly, feel free to give uh, send me an email and, and I'll give it to you. My email address again is gjohnson at usbr.gov. Thank you everyone and we hope you have a great day.